Coming up on TechZilla, we're hands-on with the Chrome OS and Google CR48. Passwords, people. Veronica's going to keep bad people on the Internet from eating your face. Sandy Bridge, you might want to wait a few weeks before you buy your next notebook. And a media server that doesn't suck. We're talking viewer reco. So fire up the hot chocolate, get your favorite carols flowing, because TechZilla starts now. This episode of TechZilla is made possible by the HP DV7T with Beats Audio and the smart Intel Core i5 processor, Sony. Go to revision3.com slash Sony for an inside look at the latest Sony gear and games. Gazelle, the fastest and easiest way to sell and recycle your gadgets. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to TechZilla. Hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Yes, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or the best place to buy computer parts in San Francisco, we've got an answer for you. And if we don't, we'll track down someone who does. Yes. 3.3 million copies in 24 hours. A lot of people bought Cataclysm, the third expansion of the World of Warcraft series last week. Blizzard's calling it. I quote, the fastest selling video game of all time. Ms. Belmont was not, however, on that 3.3 million list of people because she was in France where they have no internet. Well, right, not, not last week. I, was, okay. I became part of that 3.3 million last night, the night oh. before. <laughs> it's awesome! That would explain the bloodshot eyes, the yeah. general twitchiness around you. Well, I did get four hours of sleep last night, but that's because of my jet lag from Paris. Uh, you may have noticed that I was MIA here from Texilla a week or two ago, and that's because I was overseas in Paris for Le Web. It's where tech experts from all over the world converge to discuss the latest trends in the digital world. Hmm. You might not have been able to attend, but that doesn't mean you have to be left out of the fun. With such a tech-centric focus, it's not surprising that almost all the talks have been posted on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com slash Paris and you can choose from over 150 videos from those two days in France. Check out the 35-minute fireside chat with Marissa Mayer from Google and Michael Arrington from TechCrunch. Robert and Patrick were talking about that in the last episode, mm -hmm. from what I hear. Or take a look at the 20-minute Q&A with Mikkel Head, the CEO of Rovio, who brought you Angry Birds. It was a hilarious ba -ba moment. Ba -ba hilarious ba -ba moment with Loïc Lemieux wearing the Angry Birds costume. It was really? one of the best moments of the whole week. Or listen in on WikiLeaks media panel with Gabe Rivera, founder of Tech Meme, mm. the, also the tech editor of the Wall Street Journal Europe, and more. There's a ton of content here, so you're guaranteed to find something that grabs you. And finally, make sure you check out my interview with Playfish co-founder Sebastian Dealo on the topic of social gaming. Yeah, check out my awesome posture in that video, Were too. Were you slouching in the Yoda position? No, my awesome posture. I was had awesome posture. My mom always gives me, gives me a hard time about my posture when I sit down in videos, so I made, I made sure to have the back straight. Really? Almost too straight. It looked kind of weird, actually. <laughs> yeah, and if it makes you feel any better about missing the conference, though, it snowed and rained pretty nonstop for the entire week. Uh, not Plus that I'm had to complaining. fly like a thousand hours to get there. I had a direct on the way there and a 22-hour travel day on the way back. Any internet on the flights? Um, on the stretch from Atlanta to San Francisco, yes. So the last tiny bit. Yeah, and the GoGo in-flight held up okay, although yeah. I logged in early in the flight, and then I tried to log in again later, and, it and by that you point, off. it was like, nah, uh your internets are full. Yeah, that's a little weird about that. Yeah. Hey, if you want a new notebook, you should hold off until the first week of January if you can. We're like three weeks from the January 6th release of Sandy Bridge, Intel's next generation CPU. It's CES. That's the new architecture that'll soup up performance on mobile core i3, i5, i7 CPUs, and of course, drop prices on current processors. The rumor has it Sandy Bridge won't be fully implemented in the channel until February because Intel's trying to clear the channel of other processors everybody's avoiding because we knew about Sandy Bridge since this summer. Just saying, uh, you just might want to hold off a few weeks on that new notebook. Meanwhile, websites are getting cracked, passwords and logins are being leaked, and that brings us to our second favorite thing to talk about after backing up your important files, which is our number one thing to talk about, passwords that don't suck, Ms. Belmont. Yes, let's talk a little bit about password security folks, after the massive hacking of Gawker this past weekend, uh, which exposed the email addresses and passwords of over a million and a half Gawker commenters, we thought we'd take a moment here at Texilla to remind you of some of the best practices for password creation. <laughs> Rule number one is to use a different password for your various logins across the web. That way, if one of them becomes compromised, you're less likely to have a more widespread issue. 
Second, don't just pick a dictionary word. Don't use your name and don't use the word password for frack's sake. Jeez, I can't believe how many people use the word password as their password. Actually, password was number two on the list. Number one of the most commonly used passwords revealed by the leak was one, two, three, four, five, six. Then was password, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then you know, 40. I have to say though, if it's something that you don't really give a crap about, like if it's a site right. that you're only going to use this password for one thing and you don't really right. care if it gets hacked or not, fine, use password. I mean, but if it gets compromised, but it could be attached to other things. You could get, you know, it's just a bad idea. What they do, when somebody cracks passwords like this, the first thing they do is they take your email address and that password and they log it against like every bank in the world and every you know PayPal and eBay and anywhere right. they can scam money or scan just that's that's why we use different passwords we use code exactly ones. so Sorry. use a password generator if you want and create something nice and long over eight <laughs> characters if permitted on the website you're logging into and you know have a nice mix of numbers and letters you know that alphanumeric mix and then even symbols not all websites right. will allow you to use symbols but if you can throw them into the mix and that's probably a good thing too it makes it much harder to crack your yes. password. Yes. And finally, change your passwords on a regular basis. Every three months or so is what I'd recommend. Mm -hmm. um, and if that seems like a little bit too much, and that is pretty, pretty frequently. It's hardcore. Yeah, just make sure you're using a, a password tool like KeePass or 1Password to keep track of all your different logins so you don't need to have them memorized because it's kind of difficult to memorize that 17 digit alphanumeric password. You know, if, if you can do that though every three months though, more power to you. It's yeah, pretty good. Teach us how to do pretty that. Pretty good brain power there. Seriously though, passwords are critical for basically your data and your financial information and you know, because there's nothing worse than like logging on to eBay and being like, wow, I bought $12,000 worth of crap from somebody in, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not a good idea. Yeah, or your PayPal has been emptied or look at that, I made my checking account paid out to somebody in Nebraska. Up next! Passwords, people. No. Up next we get hands on with Google's Chrome OS and the CR48 with gadgets, Ryan Block. But first... Let's thank one of our sponsors. Today's Texilla was made possible by Sony. Sony and our fellow Revision 3-er, Anthony Carboni, put together something special for this show. Have a look and tell us what you think. Hey guys, Anthony Carboni here to tell you all about Sony Internet TV. And instead of just running some commercials, Sony sent me to the Google headquarters here in Mountain View, California, to ask some of your questions about Sony Internet TV and the Google TV experience. So I'm here with Peter Sherman from the uh, Google TV product team. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So I've heard a lot of conflicting reports about networks, uh, things like NBC, who stuff like that. But I've heard you can and you can't get them on Google TV. What's going on there? You can definitely get uh, CBS and access to any TV channel on your Google TV. It's true that some of the networks have uh, blocked access to their websites. And so we're in constant discussions with these guys uh, trying to explain um, how this affects their, uh, their models and trying to, trying to remedy this situation. And that's just some of what we talked about. To watch the entire interview with Peter and find out more about Sony Internet TV with Google TV, head to revision3.com slash Sony. The awesomeness that is the Texilla crew has raised enough money for Charity Water to build a well. Matter of fact, we've raised over $6,435. We're closing in on building a second well. That's enough water for two villages, people. You want to help provide water to four more villages? Check this out. Ford and Revision 3 have teamed up this December to start something more than a car. It's cash for charity water and a chance for you to be one of the first to drive the all-new Ford Focus in Spain. Six Revision 3 shows are duking it out for a spot in the global test drive. The winning show has a $20,000 donation to charity water made in their name, as well as a trip to join other global test drive winners in Spain for the exclusive first drive of the all-new Focus. Here's how you can get involved. Create and submit your own video. Just tell the world why you should be one of the first to drive the all-new Focus and what you would do at 10,000 towards a charity of your choice. Then submit your video at the Global Drive tab at facebook.com slash Ford Focus. Two, vote up our submission, that's up at revision3.com slash Ford Focus, using the links below each video on the page. Do me a favor, do the one under Techzilla. And three, in your video or the submission comments, be sure to mention that you want Techzilla to win and join you in Spain. See you in Madrid, people, and thanks to Ford and the 2012 Ford Focus for supporting Revision 3's Drive for Charity Water this holiday season. The man from Gadget is back, and he's got Google CR48 with him, Mr. Ryan Block. Welcome back to Techzilla, Thanks, dude. Man. This is almost really more about the Chrome operating system than than the. This is like Google's like we yep. need a whole bunch of people to test our platform. We don't have to deal with three-year-old netbooks. So they yes. like cut a check for sixty thousand notebooks or netbooks. 
This, I would say, is a netbook. Okay. I mean, it, it, this actually really defines netbook. It doesn't do anything else except go on the internet. That's it. Really? Yeah. That's kind of a scary concept. I mean, should we care that this probably isn't going to be shipped to consumers? I mean, it really is all about the operating system. It is, yes. It, the, it, this is a vessel for right. Chrome OS and nothing more. <laughs> and the Chrome OS is essentially the browser on steroids, or is it just the browser, period? Well, it's, I mean, it is as the name implies. It is the browser as the OS. So mm -hmm. everything that you do on this machine from you know, soup to nuts is right. browsing, browsing related. You basically have this window. Basically, well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like uh, like OS X, where you can mm -hmm. go into spaces and you can you can create extra windows. Right. But each window is full size. So there's there's it's you know it's 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 almost like it's like single mode. You you get a window. Windows are applications. Applications are Chrome plugins. And yeah, it's, it's very it's very iPad like. We were talking about this before the show. For a company that's like every thirty seconds talking about what they've done to make Chrome the browser faster, you felt Chrome the operating system, at least on this particular piece of hardware, was a little piggish. It is. Um, you know, I, I can't say yet if it's because it's an early beta, mm -hmm. uh, if it's because it's the hardware, if Chrome OS just is not going to be as fast as, as we hope it's going to be. Mm -hmm. it, it's too early to tell because it's very early. Uh, but it is very slow, uh, especially when you load up a bunch of tabs. It really really starts to get chunky. You gotta make sure that you disable flash. Is there, I, so there's really not a whole lot of memory inside of this thing that we know of. It's got two gigs, which should be oh. uh, enough, uh, but it's really, I think, it's less constrained by the memory mm -hmm. and more by the processor. It's got one of the lowest end Atom processors that, <laughs> that Intel makes. It's a right. uh, single core, so you, know, you, you can't play YouTube videos over 480p. Which is, is, is definitely, that's not the Chrome OS, that's the restrictions of the Atom. Atom CPU minus NVIDIA Ion graphics equals to suck on media. Um, there's, switching is fast, the performance seems to be gated by the CPU. How did you feel about getting used to doing everything in the big window? Was it like using an iPad with a keyboard? Uh, yeah, it is. It's, if you're used to the web browsing experience of an iPad or an iPhone where that is what you're doing and nothing mm -hmm. else at that moment, it's actually kind of nice. Um, if you want to do a whole lot of different things, mm -hmm. this is probably not the machine for you. Right. Uh, it's probably not the experience for you. I mean, it's definitely not the machine for you because you can't buy it. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's not, it's not the, the greatest experience, right? It is, it is a browser and it is constrained by the limitations mm -hmm. of what browsers can do today. And uh, if you don't think that you're in a place to live your life completely on the web, then this is just going to be a secondary machine. If you do not have access to the internet, you cannot use the web apps on this, it, which I was kind of shocked by. It's right. a mixed bag. You know, there, there, there's varying degrees mm -hmm. uh, of how much usefulness you can get, uh, but for the most part, all the web apps don't really do anything offline. That's kind of scary. A little bit, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's if nothing else, it's it, it means that the Google Web App Store is kind of a misnomer because right. um, you know the implication is that okay, here's a machine and this is the Chrome OS netbook and right. uh, it has apps, but well, the but apps don't run apps. offline. Yeah, it's I mean they're basically just shortcuts to the websites at this point. I'm kind of shy. Do, do you think they might implement something where you can sort of cache your files? I mean, it's it's not that hard to create a Dropbox where you know or some sort of storage that's replicated on the drive and on their drive. It just seems kind of ridiculous. We live in San Francisco. We have, in theory, more connectivity than anywhere else in the United States. Oh, we, we know that's not true. Which means we're like 42nd we all, we're in the all, world. <laughs> we all use iPhones, so that's not, that's not the case. Well, you know, it, it, it's supposed to take better advantage of mm -hmm. HTML5 local storage and you know some of the local database stuff that, uh, that HTML5 offers. Uh, but the fact is, not everybody's really optimized yet. Mm -hmm. And so right now, the web apps and the web app store are less appy and more webby. So I, I, I'll, I'll say this then, unless you're doing the most basic functions or you're really comfortable with you know, Google Docs and, and their spreadsheet, this is probably not going to substitute for your regular notebook. Yeah, I think this is going to be a good second machine. I think that this is, uh, as, as far as netbooks go, it's really interesting and impressive. And it does things that I kind of can't live without now, like replacing the caps lock key mm -hmm. with, uh, with, with a search button, a dedicated search button. That is awesome. I have to have that on my desktop now. I got to say, I use the caps lock key all the time, which is probably a bad sign for me as a human being if I'm if I'm using all caps. You so you're one of those guys, right? YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> I know you. Yeah, I'm that guy with the YouTube comments in all caps. So you actually really like the search key. I do. I, I really like it. Uh, I mean, it's the same basically as hitting Control T for a new mm -hmm. tab, uh, but it's just so nice to be able to just 
bang on that and get a new tab instantly. How many tabs before the performance starts to falls off a cliff? Depends on what's loaded. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you and I One were kind YouTube of YouTube video. Right, exactly. You and I were kind of <laughs> testing it out backstage, and and, and uh, I loaded up the big picture, which is that photo, mm -hmm. uh, that photojournalism site. And one of those windows, which totally shocked me, just completely brought the system to a halt. And there's no flash on that page, right. just just images. Or maybe some Java or Flash advertisements in the background. <laughs> well, I have Flash disabled, so I don't know. Oh, really? Yeah. I wonder what it's doing in the background. Does it resume fast? You, know, you close the notebook lid, you open it up, does it resume really fast, or are you waiting for things to kind of restore in the background? It does, no. It, it loads really quickly, it starts really quickly, but if you've ever had a, uh, uh, a, a Mac with an SSD, right. you know what that's like. Right. Uh, when you open up your Mac with an SSD that's been in suspend, it's almost instantaneous. When you boot it, it's under 30 seconds. Right. So, uh, you know, this is the direction these things are going. I mean, this has an SSD. The new MacBook Air has an SSD. MacBook Pros can be bought with SSDs. Right. Once you do solid state, it opens up a lot of performance. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm still lamenting. I pulled the SSD drive out of my notebook to put it back in my desktop, and every time I open the lid, I'm like, waiting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> waiting, waiting. It is, it, 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 hearing those hard drives grind is just, yeah. So not a lot of hardware support, mouse, keyboard, maybe a webcam. I, I noticed people have been online and been trying to connect to, you know, hard drives to them with, with no success. Yeah, can't put a hard drive in yet. Do you think it's, I mean, it's kind of like the operating on this seems like it's shared with the all of the Google TV devices, and it seems like a very, I can't decide if it's very controlled in the Steve Jobs sense, or they're like, we just don't want to enable anything that might break our hardware. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a little bit closed off. It's not the most, uh, in terms of being part of the, ecosystem, the hardware ecosystem, mm -hmm. it's not the most uh, engaged device you're going to own. And, and that's okay. I mean, that's kind of the point, right? right. It's, it's not supposed to be the center of your digital life. It is supposed to be kind of an endpoint, you know, not unlike the iPad. Uh, if you think about the iPad, the iPad doesn't really, nothing goes into the iPad, right? It, right. The iPad is, uh, is, is the endpoint for all that stuff. So this is, this is not a substitute for Linux. It's not a substitute for Windows. It's not a substitute for OS X. It's maybe a competitor for the iPad or some of the other tablet devices. Do you expect this to show up on tablets? You know, I, I don't know if I would say that it's a competitor for the iPad, and I don't know if I, I, I think that they're going to do something tablet-y mm -hmm. with Chrome OS, um, mostly just because most of the touch-optimized experiences that Google has spent its time on, uh, yeah, it's all Android right. now. Um, I think that this is going to kind of be the netbook and, and the, the laptop OS that they have, as, insofar as they mm -hmm. have one. Uh, and and I think that's going to be good enough for a while. Why is I mean why is why is uh, I mean obviously Google's now making cars that drive themselves. So Google can pretty much do anything they want at this stage. But why would Google be moving into an operating system when they already have an open source operating system in Android? Well, Google's a web company mm -hmm. through and through. Uh, that that is that is the core of everything they are. That is that where, where they are the most confident. We are internets. Yes, they they not even just internet. They are web. Right. That is that is. The Google, you know, if there's one thing that, that Google is, it's web. And so for them to create a web-optimized desktop experience really benefits them. Right. For them to do anything web-optimized really benefits them, which is why they spent so much time on Android to begin with, is because it's a great mobile web experience. So do you expect the, the, the devices, because basically Samsung and Acer, the, the two companies that are expected to release the first Google Chrome OS netbooks or whatever they're going to call them. Do you expect this to be a fair approximation of what they are? Do you expect them to be much more powerful? I think so. They'll probably be uglier than this. I mean, I really like this design. Well, it's like the, the, it's like the texture of the ThinkPad on something with, there's no branding on it. Yeah, there's no all. branding. Uh, it's got a soft touch finish. It is the most, probably the most minimal laptop, I think. I mean, even more minimal than most Macs. Like, it is, it's shocking well, it how little it does. it doesn't have the gigantic, gaudy Apple on the back, <laughs> yes. which I hate with you know, right. a fiery passion. It doesn't have anything on the bottom either. Yeah, it's just completely, it's plain, completely minimal, uh, which is great. I love understated devices like this. Uh, no, I think I think that the laptops you're going to see are probably going to be a little bit more expensive mm -hmm. um, than I think what this would go for. Right. They're going to be a little bit higher end. Uh, they're going to be a little bit uglier. Um, <laughs> I, I can't say that for sure, but probably. a little bit more aesthetically uh, loud. Yes, <laughs> um, but you know, they, they, they'll, right. hopefully, they'll also be a little bit faster. Gadget.com. That's where you live. What's coming up for the holidays? Uh, well, we're actually giving away five of these. Nice. Uh, this week, we're doing one a day for all five days, and I know you guys come out on Thursdays, so I think you should have a chance to win one or two of one. them. Yeah, one. <laughs> one and a half, Confidently maybe. one, yes. If nothing else, confidently one. The way one. our encoding system has been the last couple of weeks, we'll say one. All right. <laughs> yeah, just add it to your want list. I like that thought. Anything else going on for the holidays? Just that lots that's of gadgets. Not enough. <laughs> lots well, of gadgets. Nexus S, um, CR48, these are the big ones right now. 
Awesome stuff, Ryan. Thanks, Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, GDGT.com is the site. You should be going to check it out. Still to come, podcasting your precious memories. That Ryan Block sure is handsome, isn't he? Yes, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Gazelle. Have a bunch of tech gear and gadgets that you don't use anymore but not sure what to do with them? Try Gazelle. Gazelle accepts more than 300,000 products from over 20 different electronics categories. Shipping is free on all items of value, and in most cases, they'll even send you a box to ship with. Also, for you green folks out there, Gazelle makes all the recycling partners adhere to some strict policies. No exports, no landfill policies, and tons of data security standards. Gazelle is a great way to get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone or Android phone. Check it out at gazelle.com. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, bensbargains.net. If you're looking to do some last minute gadget and tech shopping for the holidays, look no further than Ben's Bargains. This Roger Shank tested and approved site is loaded with tons of recent deals and coupons from all over the web. Here's how it works. As you can see, the site isn't much to look at, but we don't care about fancy site design, no, no. We want the deals. You can search by category, which runs the gamut from apparel to printers, and see all the latest bargains pulled from a multitude of websites. Alternately, check out the popular posts, which will show you the most bookmarked, clicked, or discussed deals. Each deal has a little blurb explaining what the item is, and if you click on the compare link, you'll see what the going price is for that item on other websites. This is a helpful way to see how much you're actually saving. You don't do any actual buying from Benz. They'll send you right to the sale page on the retailer's site, but they probably get a good bit of moolah back from referral fees. Now, I never thought I'd be taking shopping advice from Roger, but he definitely found a great way to get deals over at BenzBargains.net. The following segment on podcasting is brought to you by the HP DV7T with Beats Audio, powered by the smart Intel Core i5 processor. With the holidays here, there are plenty of opportunities for taking photos, sending greeting cards, and podcasting. That's right, podcasting. The holidays are a great time to podcast. With all your friends and family all in one place, you can record and share spur-of-the-moment thoughts, sentiments, and the general zeitgeist of the season. So here's our guide to ensuring that your podcast is as clear and intelligible as possible. And here to help me is Texilla producer and co-host of the East Meets West podcast, Roger Chang. Hello. I always have trouble saying that podcast name. Eats Meets West. Eats Meets West. Eats Meets West. <laughs> e All right. Well, first off, of course, you need the gear, right? You need the gear, right? So you generally want to start off with a computer because really without the computer, you're not going to be doing much of anything. No. So you can either use a Mac or a PC, much like the HP you have in front of you, uh, something ideally that is capable of recording audio uh, into it. So basically a line in or an audio input of some type. Now, if you don't have one of those, you could, as long as you have a USB jack, you can get either a USB sound card uh, on a USB stick or have one of the mixers uh, that do support USB out. Exactly, a mixer, uh, something to allow you to send in more than just one audio source at a time. If you're on a budget, check out getting a cheaper analog mixer that you can then run into your sound card's audio input jack. And this is a big uh, thing that most people overlook. They think, well, I can just run a couple of mics straight into the, the PC. Mm. You want a mixer because that allows you to do the control that you need to make sure that you can kind of attenuate different people's voices, mm -hmm. especially if you talk, uh, if you have someone who's talking who has a very high, high pitch voice and then someone else who has a very low voice. Right. And you kind of want to make sure you meet them in the middle before you send it out to the computer. That, that we're not doing a bunch of post processing and there's all sorts of weirdness going on in the audio uh, uh, application. Exactly. Then you're going to need some kind of combination of mic, headphones, or then just a single headset unit. Mics are super important. Quality recording begins with quality microphones. If you're having trouble deciding, email some of your favorite podcasters, ask what they use. Um, I, for example, I have a Shure SM7B, which is a little more on the expensive side of what most people want to start with, but it has really great vocal quality. Yeah, now, if you're on the budget side, again, you can make do with PC headsets, but do get one that does offer a really good microphone on it. Oftentimes, you'll find them in the gaming section of uh, PC accessories. Uh, typically, you want something that does feel comfortable at the same time doesn't give you too much of a tinny sound that mm -hmm. you get with uh, cheaper, like really cheap. I've headsets. also found that gaming headsets tend to have better audio quality. Yes. I don't know why, but you also want something that has like a little windscreen on the tip yep. so you don't get that, that popping yeah. in 
while you're talking. They're designed for vocal communication, especially through games, so they're kind of attenuated for, for the human voice. So generally they work pretty well if you're not, you know, not too concerned about like rebroadcasting over over like radio. Right. Um, now if you're going with a mic, you do want to have headphones because you don't want to have speakers in the same room that are that you're monitoring the audio Feedback with. Feedback loop. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the worst thing. And you want to make sure that you do get headphones that uh, give you a nice balanced sound and doesn't color it uh, any much. You don't want like DJ headphones. Actually, maybe you do want DJ headphones, but you don't want the headphones that accentuate the bass or, or accentuate some mid portion of the audio because then you think you are listening to something that you're not and you're going to adjust the audio levels differently. Right, and make sure you keep an eye on whatever recording software you're using, like Audacity, for example, to make sure you're not going too far into the red because no one likes that peaking sound, that, that choppy kind of awful sound that happens sometimes. Yeah. You know, Audacity is great. It's actually one of the go-to for a lot of people who start off in podcasting because it's so easy to use, it's free, and it's incredibly flexible. You can mix and match different audio sequences. For example, in East Meets West, we used to basically load in the front music for our podcast, and we could record from that point forward without necessarily uh, doing anything fancy. That's exactly it. what we do for Sword and Laser, too. We have all the ad spots and all the intro music and everything like that. Apparently, it's promote your side podcast yes. day here and on it's, Texella. There's also another common thread. Is <laughs> Tom, Tom Merritt <laughs> is also both of our co-hosts on our other podcasts. Now, anyway, yeah, now, now, as we do podcasts, one of one of the more important things you want to make sure about is the surrounding. You want to you want to ensure that the room that you're in or location that you're at is relatively quiet. Now, if you're doing something on location, yeah, I'm sure you want the rustles of the leaves, the wind blowing, and all that stuff. But if you want to do a regular podcast, you want to make sure you find part of the house, the apartment, or whatever that is relatively quiet, and that you can soundproof. Because depending on what kind of room it is, you'll get audio reflections that will color the sound that goes into the microphone. Yeah, you don't want that that kind of echoey big room sound in the background either. It just Unless you're sound going great. for that, but then I don't think most people eh, are. Not most of you are, but you can just hang up some blankets. Or you can some, hang up some, some blankets, fabric. pillows, anything that absorbs sound, mm -hmm. uh, which would be good. I mean, if you have a bunch of stuffed animals that you can nail to the wall. That's weird and creepy, but well, yeah, what? that would work. It would work great. What are you mm -hmm. talking about? Okay. And finally, just do some test records when you have everything up so you can kind of do a before and after and you can tell how much of a difference you made and where you need to work on. Say you got the high ends, but you still get a little uh, uh, mid-range that you need to fix. And then, of course, you have to figure out your programming. You have to decide what your podcast is about. There's nothing worse than a rambly podcast with more uhs and pauses than content. Now, I am guilty, actually. Tom and I were guilty of that the first time we did, did East Meets West. Of course, no one really listened, so it didn't matter. But... Uh, not you don't necessarily need a, you know a full game plan, but you do want to have an idea, and you definitely want to keep the podcast moving. Yeah, you don't want to have long drawn out portions where there's empty spaces because people think there's a something wrong or b they're at the end of the podcast and, and they just stop. move on. Yeah, they're going to move the on. Next thing. So you know one of the things we do is actually keep a clock in front of us to keep us on time. So okay, no five minutes has passed. Let's move on to the next subject. Great. Let's keep it moving. Keep keep things having a, a tempo to it. So people will feel like they're they're kind of engaged in it. And also keeping track of what you're talking about on your show is really important. We do that with Google Docs. We just have a spreadsheet of all the links that we're discussing for Sword and Laser, and then we actually just take that exact content and publish it on the blog post afterwards as show notes so people can follow what we've been reading. Exactly, and it's you would so viewers love stuff like that because mm -hmm. it allows them to follow along with your podcast, and the more they feel invested in it, the more likely they are to continue listening to the podcast. Right. Now, podcast is nothing without distribution. That's so, uh, what are some of the, the ways you guys uh, distribute your podcast? Well, of course, we use RSS. It's a great way to get your show out there into people's podcast aggregators. Just set up an account at Google's Feed Burner, enter in your website, and it'll generate the feed automatically. And then you just plug that feed into iTunes. You can just say, I want to add a podcast. You put the feed in, you add all the pertinent inf information, the album art, the title, the genre, and then within hopefully a few days, you're, you're on the major, the biggest podcast aggregator of them all. And once that's up, I guess you solicit. You do want to kind of let people know, let mm -hmm. friends, family, especially if it's something around the holiday times and it's something that people want to make sure that they get on get in on and they can share with coworkers and friends like, hey, look what my son did over the, the holiday weekend. We, we recorded this great thing called a podcast. You should listen to it. You can find it on iTunes, get in the link and stuff. Uh, but once you're going, it's, it's kind of weird because podcasts tend to take a life 
unto themselves. They become an organic thing, mm -hmm. and sometimes, much to your dismay, you find out that they're not always kind of in control of it. But once you once you get on that road, it's actually kind of cool. Yeah, we've been doing Sword and Laser for three years. How long have you been doing Eats Eats Meets West? East Meets West East has been Meets good. West. I've done my podcast for about five years, and and believe me, it's not something we planned for a five-year period. It's just, as I've said, it's taken a life of its own, and it's grown uh, to a healthy number of, of viewers, I mean, or listeners. When we first started, we had maybe 300, and now we have a, more than 300. Mm. <laughs> Keeping his numbers under his belt, that's, that's yeah. good, it's important. But, uh, but definitely, it's something that, if you're interested in, yeah, check it out, try it out, and uh, if the first one doesn't work, you know, people have been known to reinvent their podcasts and develop new ones. It's not something that you, you know, there, there's a hard and fast rule for. And really have fun with it, because you're not having fun with it. There's no point in doing it. All good tips. And after the break, more of your viewer questions. But first, let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, the HP DV7T with Beats Audio, powered by the smart Intel Core i5 processor. With the Intel Core i5 processor, your notebook won't blink when it comes to playing the latest game, watching an HD movie, or managing a massive music library. It's got a built-in subwoofer, and it's optimized for studio quality sound. Even more, it has a brilliant HP display with True Vision webcam for crystal clear chat. All of that housed in a brushed aluminum case. Thank you, HP and Intel, for sponsoring Texilla. Mark from Michigan responded to a question we had in an earlier episode about DLNA playback on Blu-ray players or DLNA not playback on Blu-ray players. He writes in, I found a DLNA server that actually works with my setup, Mesmo. It seems a lot of folks are having a hard time getting Sony Blu-ray players and their TVs to take full advantage of the DLNA protocol. I think it's a version conflict issue, but who can say for sure? As you may remember, I had limited success with Windows Media Center. Photos and music worked fine while videos MPEG-2 only. PS3 media server was a big disappointment. I fiddled with it for three hours and couldn't get the Blu-ray player to attach to the server. Server does not support DLNA. I spent another two hours with Tversity and watched the system show number 88 on setting up the server. Roger and Patrick did a great job of explaining it. Thank you, it was mostly Roger. And it was an easy setup. While I was able to get the Blu-ray player to see the server and navigate to its folders, I was unable to get oh, it to no. display any content. Oh, it's so frustrating. That's a transcoding issue. After digging through all the support forums for both products, I found found one person who posted that, quote, Mesmo worked right out of the box. Now, this is technology I can use. You get 15 days for free. It's $30 to purchase. Seeing as it actually works, I would have been willing to pay even more. Mesmo does not restrict video file formats, except that it doesn't seem to like DRV-MS files, and neither do I after this experience. <laughs> Please share this nugget of information with your audience. I hope they find it useful and can skip most of the anxiety I went through to get to this result. Mark in Madison Heights, Michigan. Talk about going the extra mile, That huh? was awesome, Mark. You I'm went through all that pain so you didn't have to. Yeah, I'm glad it worked out for you. I'm really sorry it was such a mess dealing with that. It's, it seems that, you know, not all DLNA is created equal. Although it's, it, I've never had that much trauma I just hate it, it when things won't work. Mesmo people, check it out. <sighs> and finally, Lorinda writes in asking, we have an iMac, a MacBook Pro, an Apple TV, first generation, iPad, iPod, and an iPhone. <laughs> we need a new router and have a lot of movies we need more storage for. I bought the time capsule, but I'm concerned about the poor reviews. Losing data after 18 months, loud fan, overheating problems, and refurbishing needed. I'm wondering if I should return it for the extreme and a hard drive. One that is accessed wirelessly? My husband is a computer guy. Me, complete opposite. I knit. Perspective. <laughs> Can you recommend a system for me? The router is a must. And then what? My guts say to get the airport extreme, then that hard drive. But if the time capsule is any good, I would like to keep it and just add the hard drive. Hey, Lorinda, thank you so much for writing in. Um, so just to clarify, okay. she's got the time capsule, which is a wireless backup and storage device for your home. Uh, you can store all your files, your movies, your music, whatever, right. and then sync backups from multiple machines, which is good because they obviously have a very Apple household. So <laughs> An that, Apple -y that household. Works. Um, and, uh, it's not my favorite. Not your favorite? Yeah, I mean, it's, I it's expensive. Of, and and it's, I had a lot of friends who had time capsule fails. Mm -hmm. You've been saying, though, that in theory the new ones are better. Yeah, that's uh, what I've heard is that it was a bad batch and mm -hmm. that Apple's kind of acknowledged that was an issue and since then has, has fixed it going mm -hmm. forward, but I don't have one personally, so I can't really speak to that right. in terms of having great success using one. <laughs> uh, yeah, though, since you can hook up any USB hard drive to the airport 
Extreme. Um, it wouldn't be, need to be a wireless external hard drive. Any right. USB drive should plug into the Extreme. Yeah, the Airport Extreme handles all the wireless parts, so right. the drive doesn't need to even worry about that. There are some wireless hard drives out there, <laughs> like the, uh, the WD networking drive, or there's one from Seagate. Um, there's a few of them out there to choose from, but that doesn't matter if you're using the, the Airport Extreme. Can you attach multiple USB drives to the Airport Extreme? I'm not sure. I think it's just one. Okay. I don't think you can like daisy chain. I was gonna say I like I can do myself with like 19 hard drives full of video. But I mean, hard drive space <laughs> is so cheap now too. Right. Like for external hard drives, that it would make more sense I think to get it's like to get a super large like like three terabyte external hard drive, two terabyte external hard drive. I would, I would stick with two terabyte until somebody else finds out if the three terabyte drives work with the Airport Extreme. That's true. Okay, so two terabytes, <laughs> and then kind of yeah. If the new router is a must, as you say, then I would go for the Airport Extreme and a large external hard drive. Yeah. That way you can always upgrade to a larger drive down the road, which is nice since, as we said, prices are always dropping. And you're already yeah. probably getting more video all the time. Yeah, it's a, it's a more future-proof solution for yeah. this issue, I would say, and then getting time capsule. Um, there's a ton of different ways you can do what you're looking to do, various other routers and drive combos, mm -hmm. but if you're happy with your Apple stuff and want to go with that, then that will work. So go with your gut. <laughs> go with saying. the gut. Get the external USB. For everybody watching, we live in your questions. Do me a favor. Email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how-tos, you ask us. We'll do it, but we need your emails to guide us. So please send them to techzilla at revision3.com. Even better, send us in a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Techzilla. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. All right, well, thank you guys so much for watching. We love on your questions, so email us. Wait, where'd the other question go?